Okay, so we're going to get started today. Um, the uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is, uh, you know, obviously we missed the week of class. The good news for you guys is next semester they're cutting two weeks out of the semester anyway. So they're changing the time so you get a 16-week semester instead of an 18-week semester in the fall. So I've already been planning ahead for what's going to get adjusted and moved. So we're going to implement some of those changes. One of those changes is happening today. So previously, uh, lecture 113 and 114 were two separate lectures. And I'm kind of squishing both of them together, uh, which is fine. Um, all it does is it shortens the amount of pen, pen tool practice that you're going to have. Um, but if you get through the alphabet, you'll still, you'll still get plenty of pen tool practice. Um, so we're switching today from uh, InDesign into Illustrator. So we've moved kind of quickly through the InDesign realm or into Illustrator. Doesn't mean we won't come back to it. Um, so just like with the transition from Photoshop to uh, InDesign, we're going to do the same kind of you know, quick transition into uh, Illustrator, but we'll still be using both Photoshop and um, InDesign. So it's, it's kind of everything builds on itself. Today, in terms of talking, I want to talk about the difference between vector and raster graphics, which is essentially what is the difference between Photoshop and Illustrator, and why do we have each program in the first place? And I think one of the things that happens is people get really comfortable in one particular piece of software. We'll call it Photoshop, for example, because that's usually what everybody gets comfortable in. You become really comfortable in Photoshop, and then you just rely on doing everything in Photoshop when there are more appropriate software packages out there for you to be working in. So uh, let's talk about the difference between these two and what they mean. So first off, raster graphics. This is what Photoshop is made up of. Essentially, what raster graphics are, are we have an image. And all the way across that image, there are individual little colored squares called pixels. And those little colored squares make up what the overall image is. And you've seen this in Photoshop. As you zoom in, a lot of you when, you, when you did the cutting out of shapes, you zoomed in far enough to see all those little boxes that show up. Those are the individual pixels that make up the image. When you take a picture with your camera or your phone, your camera has a rating on it of so many megapixels, so many million pixels. That's what it captures. That's what it's talking about. How many of the little squares will it capture? The thing about it is the more you zoom in, the more blurry or the more pixelated the image gets. It's always the case. Raster graphics allow you to have pixel by pixel colors. So it's very flexible. You can have an extremely smooth gradient from one color to another color because it's a pixel by pixel basis. Just this color, this, this pixel is this color. This pixel is slightly different than that color. Um, so it's really accurate for your final image color and allows you a lot of flexibility in, your, in terms of how do you customize it, how do you work with it, things like the clone stamp tool. Copy this pixel from here over to that pixel there. It's really easy to edit where complex colors are important. Clone stamping is a good example. Those kinds of things are great in a raster graphic, right, where we have all those individual pixels. It's also easy to apply fancy effects to the image because, again, it's all just pixel based. The disadvantages of a raster graphic are essentially that the more you zoom in, the more blurry or choppy that image is going to become. So at some level, you get to the point where you're seeing the individual pixels that make up the in image, the individual squares. So if I always find these amusing. You guys drive into San Francisco, and you see the big billboards that say, shot with an iPhone. Right? Eh, I think that's stretching it a little bit. Just the resolution, you, you go to blow something up that big, and unless it was absolutely perfect and really cr you did a bunch of extra processing on it or whatever, essentially you're going to get these little squares. And maybe it's that when we see that billboard, we're far enough away that we can't distinguish that there's little squares on it. But at some level, the more you zoom in, the more you're going to see those little uh, squares. Raster file sizes tend to be large. Because if you think about trying to make up a big image with a bunch of little colors, we need data for every one of those pixels. This pixel is this color. This pixel is that color. So the files have to be large. There's a lot of information there. Raster images generally take more computing power, more processing power to work with. You'll notice a big difference when you're working in Photoshop versus working in Illustrator. It's a lot harder to work in Photoshop. Your, your scratch disk sizes get really large 
If you're running out of space on your computer, it starts to slow down a lot more when you're using Photoshop than when you're using Illustrator. Vector graphics, on the other hand, this is the alternative. This is the opposite. Are mathematical definitions of lines or shapes. So if we think about a cube, and this is a, a big simplification, but if we think about a cube or a square, if we define mathematically each corner point, and we say these are the four corners, and it's filled with red, it's a very small bit of information. And the computer can say, yeah, those four points, let me connect straight lines and fill it with red. It doesn't matter then how far you zoom in. It's always going to be defined as a nice, sharp line. So you get scalable images. You can always enlarge a vector graphic as big as you want, because it's mathematically defined. These four points make a smooth square in between them. No matter how big you make it, it will always be a smooth square, just those four points. File sizes tend to be really small. Instead of having this pixel is this color, this pixel is that color for 12 million pixels, we have four points, fill in everything inside of it with red, and everything outside of it is white. That's a really small file size. No surprise, then, it's much easier to work with on the computer. So it doesn't take so much computing power to work with vector graphics. Disadvantages. They're not particularly good for photographs. So where we need smooth transitions of colors, we, if we try to convert into vector graphics, we're not going to get those smooth transitions. I actually, I think this uh, image on the side here is a pretty good comparison. So this image here is your raster graphic. This image here is your vector. Okay, and you can see as you look at it, this one obviously looks like a nice, smooth, regular photograph. And if we look at the translation here, if you look carefully, you can see that there's colored regions of this is one color. It's trying to define this photograph into shapes that are then have a particular color associated with them. So this is very much not a photograph anymore. It's almost like painterly. So, Vector graphics aren't good for photographs. Vector graphics are also not as universal as your JPEGs or your PNGs. If you have a JPEG or a PNG, chances are any device that you have, iPad, phone, computer, it'll open it. No problem. It's easy. Vector graphics, you have an AI or you have an EPS file. Those are vector graphics files. A DWG file is a vector graphics file. That's an AutoCAD file. You generally need that particular piece of software to open it. So it's not going to be universal. You're not going to just open it in some default viewer on your computer. You're going to need something a little bit extra for it. So they're definitely not as universal. So when and where to use vector versus raster. So generally speaking, in the raster realm, we're talking about photographs, high dynamic range images, HDRI background images for rendering, stuff like that. Vector graphics, on the other hand, are line drawings architectural drawings, design drawings, those kinds of things. Logos. So if we're going to do it, we are actually going to do a logo in this class. If we're going to do a logo, you'd want to be able to blow it up bigger. So it makes sense to have that as a vector graphic. And fonts. You notice that when you blow up fonts, let's say we have a font of a 12 point, and we select it, and we say, you know what, I want it to be 72 point. The edges are always smooth. That's because a font is a vector graphic. It's defined mathematically. So let's look at an example here. So I've got a logo. It's this logo right there. And we have it at various resolutions. So the first resolution is pretty small. And if we looked at it, that logo in vector size is 36 kilobytes. Pretty small in file size. The, the raster size, or in this case, they're calling it the bitmap size, of that same image is 57 kilobytes, almost double. Again, not a big deal. It's really small. Both are really small. We're not going to worry about it. We jump up in resolution, though. There's 800 by 248. The vector size stays exactly the same. <laughs> Remember, it's mathematically defined. It doesn't change. The bitmap size is significantly higher because we're defining individual pixels. These pixels are red. These pixels are white. Blow it up even further. Same size for vector. 
and we've got a two megabyte file now. So there's a big difference in file sizes as we go higher. The other thing that happens is as we zoom in, we get these pixelated blocks. So here we are, same logo, and they're zooming in right here on that little wingtip. If we go to a vector graphic, we're at 1600% of zoom, it's perfectly smooth. So that's all perfectly smooth along the edges, exactly as we would expect. The same graphic converted, uh, they call it being rasterized, but converted into a um, raster graphic. We zoom in to 1600% and look at all those little squares. It's not nearly as clear. So there's a big difference. So in terms of what computer programs are using what, you can probably sort this out on your own. Things like Photoshop, GIMP is the open source version of Photoshop. Things like V-Ray that do renderings, those are all creating raster images or they're working with raster images. The opposite, the vector graphics, are Illustrator, which we're going to work with today, but things like AutoCAD, Vectorworks, Revit, those are all vector-based graphic programs. Rhino is another example. So these are fundamentally different than our photo example, SketchUp, another example uh, of, a, of a vector graphic. Okay, so there's just different programs and they're intended for different things. So at least my hope today is that you have a better understanding of the difference between those two. Yeah. So when we use Rhino, do the rendering, not the V-Ray, what we get? Rhino's rendering engine will still, it would, it would convert over to the raster side. So whenever you're rendering out from Rhino, regardless of whether you're using V-Ray or one of the other plugins to do the rendering, that's still taking the vector graphic and making it into a rasterized image. So we're converting at that point. It's a process of conversion. OK, so I'm going to switch over. I'm not going to take a break because that wasn't very long. I'm going to switch over to the other computer, uh, and we'll start going through Illustrator. OK, so bear with me for just a second. OK, so um, we're going to move over into Illustrator. Uh, and I'll, <coughs> sorry, I'll start by opening up um, Illustrator. If you guys are looking for it and it's not readily available, you can go into your all apps uh, and then into the Adobe Design Standard, and you should see Adobe Illustrator CS6. And it will open up. I'm going to make sure that I'm back into the Essentials workspace here. Looks like I've made a few customizations. Sorry about that. OK, and the first thing I want to do, just like I did with Photoshop, just like I did with InDesign, before we get too far into this, I want to talk through the interface so that you know what to expect as you're working um, in Illustrator. When we first open it up, you'll see across the top is our standard file menu structure. Almost everything's available through those uh, menus should you need a particular command. Running down the left side uh, of, the, of the workspace here, We've got a bunch of tools. These are the commonly used tools. We're going to work today primarily with the pen tool. That'll be our, our, our primary tool. When you click on a particular tool and you start to work with that particular tool, I don't have a document open just yet, so it's not there. But the contextual ribbon that runs across the top, just like it does in Photoshop, just like it does in InDesign, will show up there as well. So if we're working with the pen tool, there'll be tools related to the pen tool that will show up there uh, as well. On the right side, we've got a variety of our uh, menu options, uh, our, our windows. So for example, if we're working with the pen tool, we might be adjusting stroke, in which case uh, we would click on the stroke button and it would bring up the stroke window. Frequently in Illustrator, you guys haven't worked in Illustrator, the, um, the windows show up really small like this. So if I click on the stroke um, button here, I get this small window, which only gives me the option to change the weight. There are many more options that are hidden underneath. There's a little flyout menu. It's four uh, horizontal lines with a triangle pointing down on the left side. If you click on that, you can choose to show options, in which case you'll get all the options related to uh, the command. So it's, I don't know why Illustrator hides all that stuff, but it's just something that Illustrator has a tendency to do. So for our purposes today, uh, I have a template that I've worked up for you to work on. So if you'll 
go to the digital tools site, and I should have already logged in for this. My mistake. Oh, of course. All right. That's my 25 character random password. So sometimes you make a few errors along the way. Um, we're going to go to today's exercise here under spring of 2018. Uh, today is 113. We'll click on that. <coughs> and down at the bottom, you'll see download Illustrator template for exercise 113. I'll go ahead and click on that. And it will download the template for us. There it is. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show it in its folder and move it to my flash drive so it's in the right spot. So let me go ahead and copy it. And I'll put it over into my uh, OneDrive into today's folder. A new folder for today. All right, and I'll go ahead and paste that. Here. You could open it straight away. The problem is then it's existing in your, uh, your downloads folder rather than safely on your OneDrive backup. Uh, when you're done, you can double click the file to open it and we'll open up in Adobe Illustrator. So now that I have a file actually open, you can see that I've got a contextual ribbon that's, that's based on um, what's, what's, what command I have active. In this case, I had the rectangle tool active, so I have options related to the rectangle tool. Uh, for our purposes today, we're going to be draw essentially drawing the alphabet. And we're going to be using the pen tool. And it seems a little bit tedious, and the truth is, it is tedious. Um, but the only way for you to really get comfortable with Illustrator and manipulating lines is to actually work with the pen tool. And you just need some practice. You will find from here out that the pen tool is available in InDesign. It's also available in Photoshop. So if you learn the pen tool here, that same tool applies across all the Adobe suite. So it's worth your investment. It's worth your time to really uh, start to learn it. Uh, I have the full set uh, of alphabet that's, that's set up here. I'm going to take a quick look at the layers um, window. If you're not seeing it on the left side, it looks like two little diamonds on top of each other. Uh, excuse me, if you're not seeing it on the right side here, go to Window and then check the box for Layers and it'll pop up. Okay, so with that open, you can see that I have a variety of, of, uh, of layers here that have already been set up for you. Uh, I have a couple different pages. I have page one and page two. Uh, they will show us, oh, excuse me, right here. There's page one. We're seeing page one that starts with the capital letters. And I have page two, which has the lowercase letters and a couple more of the capital letters. For me, I think it's easier if you start with the capital letters. So I'm going to click on the little I next to page two in the layers window to turn that off. And with that off, I can now start to actually work on this page. Because I'm working on page one, I want my current layer to be font page one. So I'll highlight that layer in this light blue. That'll be the, the active layer that I'm working on. And at that point, I'll go ahead and minimize my layers window. There's a little double arrow, and I can click that to make it go away. So now that I have uh, the, the page one showing, it's now time to click on the pen tool. So here's the pen tool. It looks kind of like an old-fashioned ink pen. I'll click on the pen tool, and I'm going to start drawing with the pen tool. So if I zoom in, Control Plus will zoom in. I'm going to zoom in on the letter A so that I can start with the letter A. I've given you some guides to help you out. We've got a baseline. We have an X height. Remember, we talked about that in the, the typography section. That would be the height of an X. I've got a cap height or the maximum ascender height. I've got a maximum descender height. Those are all for you to give you a little bit of help. Should you choose to use them, that's great. If you don't choose to use them, no big deal. It's not the end of the world. Again, this is about practicing with the pen tool more than the, you're going to create the most awesome font ever. Okay, I get that. So 
I want to start by drawing the, the, uh, the capital A. I'm going to start at the baseline here, and I'll make a single click. And when I make that first click, that is a starting point. It's a control point for the line that I'm going to create. Uh, with that single click, I'll then move up to my cap height, so up at the top here, and I'll make another single click. And when I do that, it creates a line from the first point to the second point. If I come down to create the third point, we'll go right there, I've now created the third point. Now in this particular example, you see how my two sides aren't exactly even. I need to make a, a little bit of a change to that last side. I can do that by using the white arrow. So thus far we've always been using the black arrow in uh, InDesign, for example. The white arrow is called the Direct Selection Tool. And what that allows us to do is with the white arrow, I can actually control just one of the endpoints. So I can move that one endpoint and I can adjust it until it looks right. So I've made that adjustment. I have the, the top of the A here. It's time to go ahead and draw the crossbar. So I'll click on the pen tool. I'll come over here. Now, if I'm right on top of the line, it's going to convert the, the pen tool. See how it changes to have a little plus sign next to it? When I move over next to it, right there, it's actually creating another control point on my line. So I want to be just close to, but not on top of the line. We're going to move it there later. And I'll go straight across and be close to, but not quite on top of the line, right there. Then I'll go back to my direct select tool, the white arrow, and I'll move each of these points so that they come over and end up on the line. Yeah? What's the problem with just having the line like along the sides? Like just start from the center? Right, so if I did it, Great question. If I use the pen tool and I came over here and I clicked right on top of the line, of course now it's going to let me do it. Um, it's not giving me the plus sign, so I can, in that case, I can do it. Of course, right? See if I can do. See if I can make it. Um, there we go. So if you if you move over the line and it has that little plus sign next to it, when you go to click. It's going to add a control point, not a line. So this control point then, I could manipulate like that. So it's going to add an extra control point on it. Paisley, do you have a question or are you stretching? All right. So let me just undo back to there. Uh, if I deselect everything, it looks like I'll be able to go back to the pen tool and go right over the top um, like that. So in this particular example, my A is still a little bit thin because my line stroke weight is not that high. If I were to select these objects like that and I jump up with the stroke, we can make those a little bit thicker. So I've moved up to five point. There it is at seven point. Now you can see it a little bit better. So I have some other options to think about. So let me zoom in a little bit more so we can see. If I select, and I'm using the direct select, the white arrow, if I select the point at the top right here, I can control what the top of this A looks like. I'll come over to my stroke window. If you don't see it over here, you can go to window and then turn on stroke. If you're not seeing all of the options here, remember to click that little fly out menu and choose to show options, which gives me my options. And you'll see that there's an option for corner right here. So here's my corner. It's currently set to this miter join. If I switch to the round join, it's going to round the top as opposed to being a spike. And if I switch to the bevel join, it's going to flatten the top. I have the same option for these other points down here. Let me hold down Shift to select both of those points. And I can choose right here on cap whether I want it to be rounded, whether I want it to be trimmed even with the point, or whether I want it to extend past the point. So just a couple different options to play around with depending on the look of what you're trying to create and whether you want it to be uh, rounded or not. 
So now it's time to move on to the next letter. So I'm holding down spacebar as I pan. And now I need to draw the letter B. So this one gets a little bit more complicated. So I'll go into the pen tool here. And I'll start, I'm going to start down here at the bottom. And I'll go straight, oops, sorry, that was not the correct <laughs> bottom. Try that one more time. It should have been right here. And I'll draw straight up. And I'm getting that little green guide to help me draw straight up to create the back part of the B. Now I'll come out a little bit over here. And that was, again, a single click, a single click. I'll come out here with another single click, like that. Now when I go to draw the B here, if I just do a single click and a single click, I'm going to end up with that shape. If I want to make that a rounded shape instead, instead of doing a single click, I'm going to click and hold, and I'll drag a tangent line. So you see how I get that little tangent line? And now I have control over the arc that I'm starting to create. And I'll tell you right now, this takes a lot of practice to be perfect the first time. So I get my B. There it is. I'll do a single click down here to finish the arc. And then I'll come back in. Oops. Close to, but not on top of the line. There we go. And I finish. So I've got the top part. Now I need the bottom part. I'll come back to the pen tool. I'll start down here at the bottom. I'll come out a little bit further this time. I'll click and hold to create this part of the arc. And I'll come back up to there. Once I've drawn it, my B isn't quite perfect. So I can come back and I can manipulate it using that direct select tool, the white arrow. So first off, using that direct select tool, I can select this point and move it up on top of that point. I can select this point here and move it over to be on top of that point. But then I can also adjust the curvature. So I could take, let's say, let's take this point. Let's move it back a little bit more. And if I select this, I can adjust that tangent line. So I could say, oh, it didn't look quite right. Let me adjust it. The length controls how much arc you have. So after a little bit of adjustments, I'll get to a point where I feel good about what it looks like. Maybe about like that. And there we go. Now I have the, the letter B. We move on to the letter C. So for the letter C, I'll start with my pen tool. I'll start at the first point of the letter C. The fewer points that I have, the better. So I'm going to do one point right here at the top, one point halfway down the side, one point straight down at the bottom, and one point out there. So I could take this C and I could start to manipulate it and I could work with it. The truth is that working completely from scratch on a letter C is pretty difficult. You know, we could get there and it could end up looking OK. But the other option that I have is instead of doing it with the pen tool, I could come in with the circle tool or the ellipse tool. So I'm going to click on the rectangle. And as I click and hold, I can choose the ellipse tool. By the way, many of these commands have keyboard shortcuts. So the ellipse tool is an L, for example. If I press L, I'll go to that command. Uh, I think the, the selection tool is a V. The direct select is an A. I try not to push those because you guys can't see me push them. So I always try to click. For your purposes, it would probably be a little bit more efficient if you learned a few of them. Certainly, the, uh, the direct select being A would be helpful. Anyway, I'm going to use the ellipse tool right here. And I'm going to draw an ellipse that represents part of my letter C. And the advantage here is it's perfect. I didn't have to create this. It's just it's a perfect ellipse. But I'd like to get rid of part of this side to represent where the C is. So I'm going to come back to the pen tool. And if I click and hold on the pen tool, you can see that one of my options is to add an anchor point. This forces the little plus sign next to my pen tool. 
in which case I can add an anchor point at the top of the C, right there, and I can add an anchor point at the bottom of the C, say right there. It hasn't changed the shape at all. It just added an extra little control point on each side. I can then go back to the direct select tool, the white arrow, and I can click on this one point that's in the middle. So I added a point there, I added a point there. I'm gonna click on the one point in the middle right there, and I'll press the delete key on the keyboard. When I do that, it gives me the top, it gets rid of that segment, and I get the top and the bottom of the C. It's a lot easier to create your C that way and have it look good than to do it by hand. So we'll move on. We'll move to the letter D. I'll go back to the regular pen tool. We'll start at the top and draw straight down. If I want to make sure it's straight, I can wait for that green snap, or I can hold down the shift key on the keyboard to create it straight. And this time we'll come out just a bit, and then right there, I will drag out the D, and then I'll come back to right there, and then come back and connect it. Obviously, I've had a lot of practice going through and, and in how to do this. If I didn't like how smooth this was, I could come in with the direct select tool, the white arrow, select this center. I can make the D a little bit wider. I could also make it a little bit taller that one a little bit taller like that and ultimately get to the the place that I like E is obviously really easy it's just straight lines so we go down to there there and we come back there and one more for the E like that and I don't know whether that's how I want the E to look, but you guys get the idea. So E, F, those are all fine. G is probably another example of where the circle comes into play, the ellipse tool. I could create the ellipse first. I'll come in and add my anchor point at the top. And right there, I'll come back to the direct select tool, the white arrow. Click in the middle here, press the delete key. That opens up my G. Now I can come back with the pen tool, start at this point and come in. I'll hold down shift so it's straight and draw that part of the G. H is pretty easy, etc. You're moving your way down. Then we get to the really hard letters, like an S. So an S just fundamentally takes practice. So remember, as few control points as possible. So I'll start here, oops. All right. I'll start there, control point at the top, control point right there, control point right there, control point right there, and control point right there. So not too bad for my first shot at, but it always takes a little bit of adjustment afterward to get that S to look the way you want it to. So what I want you to do for today, for the rest of today, is to practice. You'll start with the uppercase letters. I think they're a little bit easier than the lowercase letters. I want you to get through the uppercase letters. If you do, you can move on and do page two, which will give you more practice. It'll give you the lowercase letters. Uh, you should be here. You should work for the remainder of the time today, which is about two hours left. You need this practice, I promise you. The more proficient and comfortable you get with the pen tool, the more you'll be able to do uh, down the road. So it's really important that you get this practice in, uh, and that's really what today's all about. There are instructions on the back of the handout if you actually want to make this into a font. If you make it all the way through and you get all your letters done, you can. there's an online um, company uh, that will actually convert this into a font that you could use. It's a little bit of a novel idea. It's not like you would write your English paper in it. It's not exactly perfect. but uh, it's a little bit of a reward if you actually make it all the way through. So I'm not going to walk through making it, uh, which was what the second half of the lecture, we finished it um, when I used to split this into two lectures. Uh, I would walk you through how to actually make it into a font. You don't have to do that. All you need to do uh, to satisfy today is to work for the remainder, the two hours, and then post the JPEG of however far you got with your letters.
Okay? There are a few other things that some of you may be interested in doing. I'm going to show them to you, though they're not uh, necessary at this point. Um, so we, I already worked with the stroke weight. So if I were to select this shape, for example, I can adjust the stroke weight right here to make it thicker or thinner. Likewise, I can adjust my corners to have them rounded or beveled, etc. We went through that. The one other thing that I have control over is something that's called the, uh, the width tool, where I can dynamically change the width at different places along this. On the left side here, there's a tool that looks kind of like a banana slug, for lack of a better term, um, with, a, with a little line that runs across it. If I click on that tool and then hover over one of these lines, let me come over the letter D here, for example. As I come around this path, I can choose a place on the path, I can click and hold, and I can adjust the width of the path at that particular point. So I could have this become thin, for example, and I could have this become fat, for example. So I can adjust how thick the line becomes depending on where it is in uh, the particular line segment. At the corners, I can adjust the corner so I can make that thicker, etc., which can give you a little bit more style to your letters should you want to, to do something like that. The other thing that you'll see on any of these uh, particular letters, <coughs> at the bottom of the stroke menu, there's something called profile. This profile is the stroke width that we were just adjusting. That was the profile that I just created, but there are a bunch of preset profiles that you can use. If you wanted to use one of those presets, you could go through and pick from those presets as well. Uniform will always get you back to where you started. Uh, let me drop that weight down to seven points again. Uh, and then I could go back in and, and manually work with the width tool to make it thicker. Like that. So I just like to point that out because some people like to start playing around with it. It's not necessary that you know that yet, but I at least like to introduce it as a concept. Okay. So the rest of the day is, is really about practice and getting comfortable with that pen tool. Uh, one more time on the deleting a line segment, let me come down to, uh, let me just do the G one more time. These are just the things that I find that people ask over and over again. Let me go back to the ellipse tool. I'll draw that ellipse tool like that. Then I'll go ahead with my um, pen tool and add an anchor point. I'm going to add an anchor point right there for the top of the G. I'll add an anchor point right here for the horizontal of the G. Then I'll use my direct select tool and click on the one point that's in between those two points. If you didn't have that point, you could create a third point that was in between. And then press delete, and you'll get rid of it. So let me show you if you, let's say that I wanted to get rid of, I wanted the G to, to stop at the very top here, or at the, the quadrant. I added this point for the top of my G. How do I get rid of this line segment? I need one more control point that's in between these two control points. Oops. Let me add the control point right there. It doesn't matter where, but it has to be in between. Once I create that last control point, I'll select it with the direct select tool. There it is, and I'll press delete, and that segment will go away. So when you're trimming out a section of a line, you always have to have a control point at each end and a point in the middle to select to get rid of. That's how a trim works. Okay? So control point, control point, and something in the middle that you can select and delete. OK, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, yeah, hands immediately go up. OK, okay. Um, so let me stop the recording, and then I'll come around and help you guys.